Today, some specialized gear that I take with me when my main objective is photographing wildlife. Well, hey everyone, Hudson here. When this video goes live, I will have just wrapped up a week uh, photographing the Milky Way and wildlife in Yellowstone National Park. We'll be moving on to another workshop in Grand Teton, kind of transitioning in between. Cannot wait, it will be a blast. I've had a lot of people both in the workshop and just in general ask me about what type of stuff I take to photograph wildlife when wildlife is really my main objective. So this video is gonna be all about that. First, a couple quick announcements. I wanna thank everyone who's been supporting this channel and driving the content. You know, by sharing, liking, subscribing to the channel, you support it. By using my links, you help support what I'm doing. Those are always available to all the gear that I use, including all the gear I'm talking about here at hudsonhenry.com slash ATS links. Uh, by leaving comments on the channel, which I pay attention to, sending me emails uh, or leaving questions in the office hours sign up, which we'll talk about in a second. That really drives the content. You as a community steer me in the direction towards things you want to know more about. So that's what we wind up talking about and exploring. Uh, and I really appreciate your all being so contributive toward that process. Thanks so much. All right. Uh, another quick announcement. I'm off on workshops right now, but we've announced workshops. Uh, we have open workshops for the first half of 2022. Uh, you can run over and check that out. We're going to have Death Valley, Joshua Tree, um, the Palouse up in Washington State, and Costa Rica. So those signups are up. Plus, we have more workshops coming soon. You can see the dates and prices on those. HudsonHenry.com slash workshops. We'll be doing more Yellowstone and Tetons, uh, a big Owens Valley workshop that I'm really excited about, as, long as, in, as well as another workshop that's based here in Portland, Oregon, exploring all the beautiful natural scenic wonder around my home city. All right, uh, the other big announcement, office hours are October 26th. They're the next big group free photography meeting. We're gonna be going through your images, so make sure you sign up, drop a question, and submit an image for us to go over uh, over at hudsonhenry.com slash office hours. Again, October 26th, 10 a.m. Pacific. Sign up, I hope to see you there. That'll be uh, up on YouTube too. It's gonna be on YouTube live, but it'll also be archived there if you wanna watch it later. Um, I guess the big final comment, the Milky Way course is out. It's available. Uh, there's much more about it on the website, but it's got field checklists for capturing both of the star tracker or star stacking, uh, editing, capture, you name it. Everything you'd like to know about photographing the Milky Way is uh, on my website. You can find that at hudsonhenry.com slash Milky Way. Okay, so let's talk about wildlife. Uh, this is a question that I get a lot. You know, what specialized gear what tripod and head should I think about using? And I'll be honest, you know, most of the time when I'm out photographing in wildlife might be something, I say I'm travel, doing travel photography. A lot of times I bring my, my 500 PF, my lightweight 500 PF lens and my FTZ adapter for my Nikon Z cameras, just in case there are birds or wildlife that I wanna photograph along the way. And I can use my fluid head in, in ways that are very similar to a gimbal. But on a trip like Yellowstone, or if I'm going on safari to Africa, you know, I, I'm much more likely to bring specialized support equipment. Before we jump into that, I'll talk a little bit about lens selection, camera body selection. I'm much more likely to use my Nikon Z6 II or my Nikon Z6 with its slightly lower resolution, higher ISO capability when I'm working with a full frame camera. Uh, it, because it winds up making it easier for me to work at higher ISOs with a long lens, which you're often using when wildlife's out at a little bit of a distance, you wind up having to use a faster shutter speed to handhold or just to, to, to capture your images. Even on a tripod or a monopod, you're wanting a faster shutter speed to freeze action with a long lens and to avoid camera shake if you're handholding. And so a body that performs better at higher ISO tends to be the better choice. You know, our big high resolution, ultra megapixel landscape cameras in general tend to yield more noise as you crank that ISO up. So, you know, you can save a couple stops of noise using a lower resolution, cleaner sensor. It's rare I wanna blow up uh, an image of, of wildlife to building size. And let's face it, 24 megapixels can blow up big and beautiful for a giant print. So. 
A lot of times that's my choice of camera. When it comes to lenses, I know there's uh, everyone, you know, there's a mad rush to the 200 to 600, 200 to 500, those kind of ultra zoom telephotos. They're great, they can take great images, but their performance isn't nearly on par with the primes. And I, as a Nikon user, I adore these PF lenses. I'm sure they'll be coming for the Z mount at some point, but they perform so well through the FTZ adapter. They're lightweight, hand holdable. This is a 500. Uh, and with the higher ISO performance that you get with a camera, uh, like we have with these modern sensors, you can get away with having an f5.6 maximum aperture on a lens like this. It also accepts a 1.4 teleconverter. That's something definitely in my bag for Yellowstone because all of a sudden this goes from a 500 millimeter lens to a 700 millimeter lens by dropping this f mount 1.4 teleconverter in between the FTZ adapter and the lens. Now if you're a Nikon shooter you can't throw the Z mount teleconverter in between the camera and the FTZ adapter. You have to have the f mount one for this lens. Now, often I'm going to want some support to be able to use slower shutter speeds and a little bit, little bit higher quality ISO if the animals aren't moving rapidly and I'm worried about freezing motion. And that's where I, this dedicated little gimbal that, that I've got from Leo Photo, the PG-1, is just awesome. It's lightweight. The whole kit weighs something like seven pounds. Fits in this little kind of ukulele style case that it comes with if you buy it with the tripod. You can also just use it with your regular tripod, just bring the head along with you. I really love this kit with the CEX tripod with the leveling adapter built in. You just extend its legs, you know, I'm gonna extend three of its legs, show you how easy this thing is to set up and toss in a vehicle. Now this is if I'm going on a wildlife shoot that's vehicle based. You know, if, if I'm hiking, I'm probably just gonna take my fluid head because that's the all-in-one thing. It works great for wildlife, it works great for landscape, it works great for astro, all those kinds of things, wide angle, you name it. This is really just a long lens tripod solution. Oh, I'm going after the next, I'm getting ahead of myself. Pull the, uh, the PG-1 out of here and it just threads right on to the built-in leveling adapter on this set of legs that it comes with. And then you can just reach in here. There are three little set screws in this built-in Leo Photo leveling adapter that drive right up into the base of the PG-1. You just tighten each one of those in that thing. You don't have to over torque it or anything like that. You just lock it in with those three little set screws. I'd do the other one, but it's on the wrong side and I'm not gonna walk around for this purpose. So then all you have to do, you can raise this up a little bit if you like, just to give yourself a little more room, you can adjust the height on this, which is really nice. You don't have to nail it with your tripod each time. So I can bring it up a little bit, get it right to eye level for myself, lock it in, that's a sliding rail. And then I have a, a pan and I have a tilt. And all I have to do is put my Arca foot in there, slide the camera back and forth till I'm neutrally balanced, and then I can track motion just as easily as that. You know, if, if you prefer, you can mount it either direction. I kind of like to keep my right hand free. I like it over on the left, but I'm a right-handed shooter, you know. You loosen your foot's, uh, or your built-in foot's rotating collar, or the rotating collar on your lens, on your long lens should have a rotating collar. Once again, get that neutral balance. The neat thing is you can just let go. There's no chance of flop and you can track any kind of motion. It's a lot like a fluid head, right? It's got a nice big leveling foot right here so that you can, you can loosen the leveling adapter. There's a nice big bubble is what I'm trying to say. Right at the base right here. I can look at it from back here. I'm nice and level now. Any movement that I make is level left and right, straight up and down. If I wanted to lock this, and make precise moves, I have these two big knobs here. Pan, lock, not panning anymore. Tilt, lock, not tilting anymore. Just made and designed for long lenses. Really, really nice to have. It's a simple eight pounds to toss in the camera or in, in the car and bring along. So, you know, either just getting the head and putting it on your system with a leveling adapter at the base if you're a fluid head user like I am, or getting the whole kit that fits in this little case.
simple to use. So I'm going to go ahead and pull that off. It's just a really nicely designed setup. The other thing they get a lot of questions about and that I'm recommending, and both of these are in my links. If you go to tripods and, and camera support, fluid heads and camera support, you'll find them in there. Is a good monopod. You know, let's say you're out hiking around with a long lens. Well, a monopod can just be a fabulous way to work with a long lens and get a little bit more stability. And also just not get yourself as worn out working with a long lens. So once again, you want to tighten this slightly so it's not going to fall out. Lock your monopod head and get it to where you know your camera is relatively neutrally balanced from a tilt perspective. And I, I'm recommending a head for this monopod. I got a, a Leofoto monopod here, carbon fiber, lightweight, along with a Leofoto tilt head. And it has a nice little wrist strap. That's really important. You're going to want whichever is your non-dominant hand in that wrist strap. You can still reach up and grab your lens and make adjustments on the top of the camera. But when you pull down, it swivels around the top. When you pull down, it just roots you. You keep it at eye level and you can spin just by turning. That's why I don't like monopods with complicated feet. I don't want a fluid head, a complicated assembly up here. I just want a tilt so I can tilt and find what I want, pivot, swivel. You know, I can turn, tilt forward, backward, up and down, but tilting the camera is all I need to do. I get everything else from just spinning on that foot. Um, so a nice lightweight collapsible monopod. I'll give you two choices. I like the one that's a little bit longer. Some people prefer one that folds up really small. For me, you know, the way I travel with always having a big long set of tripod legs, this seems really small. They make one that's even shorter, that's the same gauge of carbon. You just have to open more sections and it's a little bit heavier given it has more sections and more, more locks. So I'll put both of those, both this head and both of those monopod setups in the links to this video, as well as in my ATS gear links. And those are always available on my website. Whenever I change gear, I update those links. All right, so those are things that are gonna get tossed in my, in my van for sure, that will be with me when you're watching this in Yellowstone and the Tetons. You know, the other thing that's nice about this, you make sure that your camera is locked nice and tight with the clamp, the ARCA clamp at the top. You can angle it a little bit. And as you're walking around, you can just kind of throw it over your shoulder. You see people running down the football sidelines with their big lenses on, on monopods like this. They get to where they want to take the shot, slip their hand in, lock down, loosen, and boom, away they go, they're shooting. So it's just a handy way to get a little added stability. You can raise and lower it. You can get down on your knees with it if you want, lower it down, you know, just by simple, same way you would a regular tripod. It's nice and easy. All right, last thing that I'll talk about that I'm going to bring only because wildlife is such a potential thing to photograph, like the, the big scenes in the Lamar Valley. Often you've got grizzly bears and wolves off at a really long distance. And that has me throwing in the last DSLR that I'm keeping and using, the, the Nikon D500. And why the D500? It's not about the autofocus. It's not, certainly not about the frame rate, which was impressive when it was released at a sustained 10 frames a second. It's about the really nice, high quality APS-C sensor in this camera. So this sensor's a little bit smaller than full frame. And I can mount this same, you know, 1.4 teleconverter to my D500 and then the 500 PF lens to that. And all of a sudden, instead of the 700 millimeters, it gets a 1.5 crop factor. And I get the same ability to fill the frame as if I had 1,050 millimeters. And it's frame filling. I'm not cropping into it with a higher resolution sensor. It's a, it's a 20, I think it's just over 20 megapixel, really good in low light APS-C camera made for sports action and wildlife. And it does a fantastic job, 10 frames a second, bottomless buffer, and it gives me that added reach with really good high ISO performance. So if I wind up seeing wildlife way far away and 500 really isn't enough, to fill the frame, I'm very likely to reach for my D500. And I'll probably curse the fact that I'll be hitting the play button, looking through the viewfinder and not seeing images pop up to review, that I can't zoom into 100% while I'm viewing the scene if animals are not moving very much. 
you know, all those things that I'm very used to with the mirrorless now will come glaring back at me while I'm working with the DSLR. But I'll tell you what, there aren't very many cameras, there really is not another camera like this from any of the big full frame mirrorless brands that brings the APS-C sensor along like this camera did. As Nikon users, we waited a really long time for it between the, the, the D300 release and the D500 release. I imagine as mirrorless users, we'll wait a really long time. The Z50 and the ZFC are not this camera. They're not the same high quality. Maybe someday we'll get lucky and they'll build some D500 equivalent in the mirrorless world, and I hope that that's true. But until then, I'll probably be keeping that body for all the reasons I just stated. So that's the additional stuff I'm bringing with me for photographing wildlife in Yellowstone and the Tetons. Um, you have any questions about it all, hit me up, put it in the comments. Uh, you can certainly email me anytime I'm easy to get a hold of. Quick reminder, sign up for the office hours, October 26th, Tuesday, 10 a.m. Pacific. We're gonna be going through your images. So when you sign up, please submit an image, please submit a question. That stuff really does help drive all the approach into scene content. Workshops for the first half of 2022, they're open, hudsonhenry.com slash workshops. Uh, also, you know, you can run over for that Milky Way course. There's free download to there, one of the lessons, um, hudsonhenry.com slash Milky Way. All right, so we are being very careful. Everybody in the workshop's vaccinated. We're wearing masks in the van, but we're getting together. We're being creative. We're working together as a group, looking at each other's images, learning. And I, I had so much fun in Brookings. I'm sure I'm having a blast as you're watching this and it releases in Yellowstone and the Tetons. I hope you're all finding ways to be creative safely uh, and enjoying, uh, enjoying the fall season here in the Northern Hemisphere and spring in the Southern Hemisphere. All right. We'll see you next week.